This video is an introduction to differentiation. We will talk about what differentiation actually is and what it is you are finding when you differentiate something. In order to understand it, we will look at one example and derive the answer from first principles, and then we will compare this to the standard results table. However, if you want to go straight to an example of how to use the standard results for differentiation, then you will need to see one of my next videos. The first video contains examples of how to differentiate x's with powers, and the second video gives examples of how to differentiate other common functions, such as sine, cos, tan, lun, and e. There will then be further videos on differentiating using limits and from first principles. If you are doing A-level maths, that does come up. So for now, I would advise that you watch this video to give you an appreciation of exactly what differentiation is. So to begin with, you need to understand that differentiation is all about finding the rate of change. So if we have a graph, for example, and we are looking at the rate of change or gradient of the graph. Rate of change and gradient are the same thing. So if, for example, we had a graph of displacement, the rate of change or gradient of that would be velocity. It is quite difficult to get your head around exactly what you're doing to begin with, but if you persevere, hopefully the maths isn't too difficult. So let's have a look at a simple graph. Hopefully you know that if we have a nice straight line graph we can draw a triangle and work out the change in x and the change in y and you should know that gradient is equal to change in y over change in x. I've written it here as delta y over delta x that's a capital delta and it means changing. You should have come across that in science maybe, delta T for change in temperature. It just means the same thing here. So if we have a straight line graph, we don't need any fancy differentiation. It's nice and easy because it is a constant rate of change. The gradient or the rate of change of that graph remains the same at all points on the graph. However, if we didn't have a straight line, but instead had a curve, what would happen? How would we find the gradient? Well, the way we find gradient is to take a tangent to the curve. A tangent is a line that touches the graph at a single point. So it will have the same steepness as the graph at that point, at the point where it touches. So we can find the gradient at a specific point on the graph. And as you can see, the point I've picked here where I've drawn my tangent is steep and negative. As we move along the graph, it's getting less and less steep, but it's remaining negative until we reach the bottom where it is actually horizontal, so has a gradient of zero. As we move further along, the gradient becomes positive and becomes steeper and steeper, remaining positive as we move along the graph. So as we can see, the gradient is constantly changing there is no one value that we can find, and the gradient actually depends where you are on the graph. It depends on the point that you are looking at. And so the gradient itself is going to be an equation of x. The question is, how do we find that equation if it's not one specific value? To have a look at how we can go about finding that equation, I'm going to look at an example. The example that I've chosen is y equals x squared. This is quite a nice simple example, um, but if we have a look at how to do this one, we can then think about how we can extend that onto more difficult examples. So we could draw the graph, and if we want to know the gradient at a specific value of x, we can look up on our graph and if we mark the point P, we could draw a tangent to the curve and measure the gradient. However, it is very difficult to draw a graph 100% accurately and it's even harder to draw a tangent to get a line that touches at exactly one point. It is also very time consuming to draw a whole graph and a tangent just to give us the gradient of a single point. 
It will tell us the gradient at that point, but it won't tell us anything else about the gradient of the rest of the graph. However, there is a way of working out the equation for this gradient, and if we zoom in on a small portion of the graph, we can have a look at how to do it from first principles. So if we are very zoomed in, and we take a point Q that is very close to point P, and work out the X and Y coordinates at the two points. We could then work out the change in X and change in Y, and therefore we could work out the gradient between P and Q, which would give us an estimate for the gradient at P. If we move Q a little bit closer, the gradient will get more like the gradient is at P, and our estimate will get closer. If we move it closer again, it is getting more accurate. So the closer we can make P and Q, the better the estimate of our gradient. So we are going to take a point P and a point Q that are very close together. So at P, we're just going to say that our X coordinate is X because we're generalizing. And that means that at Q, we can say that the x coordinate is x plus a little bit of x because we're only moving a little bit further along and we can write that as x plus delta x. This time I've used a lowercase delta which means a small change in. So we've got a x coordinate for p and an x plus delta x for q. So if we think about the y coordinates at p y is just going to equal x squared because our x coordinate we're just generalizing as x at q our x coordinate is x plus delta x so y is going to be that squared so x plus delta x squared so now we've got our two coordinates we can work out the change in x and the change in y so we know that the gradient is equal to delta y of delta x and if we think about our y coordinates, point P is at x squared and point Q is at x plus delta x all squared. So the change in y is going to be x plus delta x all squared minus x squared. The delta x we can do in a similar way. P is at x and Q is at x plus delta x. So we can simply do x plus delta x minus x. Now what we need to do is expand out and simplify this equation for our gradient. So to expand the x plus delta x, we can use any of the expansion methods that you might be familiar with, but I'm just going to do it in order using lines to show which ones I'm doing so you can see. So x plus x is x squared, x plus delta x is x delta x, delta x times x is the same thing, x delta x. Notice that x and delta x are two different things. We can't make it into delta x squared. And for our last term, we've got delta x all squared. So we can rewrite out the top of our fraction as x squared plus 2x delta x we have in total plus delta x all squared. That's the expansion of our bracket. And then we've got minus x squared. On the bottom of our fraction, we can cancel out the x and the minus x, and we are left with just delta x on the bottom. We can then do some simplifying from our whole fraction. The x squared and minus x squared on the top of the fraction cancel out, and that leaves us with three terms that all have a factor of delta x. So we can take out or divide through by the delta x, which will leave us with just 2x plus delta x. So we've said that the closer we can get Q to P, the more accurate our gradient will be. And in fact, if we can get Q right on top of P, so it's the same point, the gradient will be completely accurate. If we do that, then delta X is actually zero because P and Q have the same X coordinates. And if delta X is zero, and we cancel that out of our equation for the gradient, we are left with a gradient of 2x. Now I've written it here as dy over dx, and we actually say that dy by dx. This means the 
differential of y with respect to x and it's also known as the derivative of the function. This is what differentiation is. So if we were to differentiate our original equation, which was x squared, we would end up with 2x. And the way we are writing it, dy by dx, is similar to what we were doing before, where we had delta y over delta x. But we are now saying that this is the accurate gradient. And we've done that by a process called differentiation. And we write dy by dx to show that we have actually differentiated it. And it's all to do with limits as delta x tends to zero. But that's in another video. You don't need to worry about that. You just need to be aware of the notation. So we now have an equation for dy by dx equals 2x. But let's have a think about what that really means. So if y equals x squared, dy by dx equals 2x. And remember, we've said that dy by dx is the gradient or rate of change of y. So if we think about a specific point on the graph, say x equals minus 2, then dy by dx, which is 2x, will be 2 times minus 2, which is minus 4. So if we have a look at the graph at minus 2 and draw a tangent to the curve at that point, we could work out the gradient of that tangent, and it is minus 4. So we know that the gradient at minus 2 is equal to minus 4. If we think about another point, say x equals 1, we can do the same thing. dy by dx, which is 2 times x, will be 2 times 1, which is 2. And if we zoom in and have a look where x is 1 on our graph and see if that makes sense, we can draw a tangent, work out the gradient, and it will in fact be 2. So this gives us a nice, easy method and it is really useful. It was a nice, simple result, 2x, and that allows us to work out the gradient at any point on the graph rather than just one specific point, which is what we would get if we were drawing it. But obviously, we have only talked about y equals x squared. This is one specific graph, and it is unlikely that you are going to be interested in that exact graph. There are an infinite number of possible graphs you might be interested in, so we need to have a think about how we could go about finding the gradient of other graphs. Now we could go through the same process that we've done there and take a point a little bit further along and then think about what happens when delta x tends to zero or becomes zero. But luckily somebody has already worked out some rules for us and come up with some general rules that will always work. and put them into a standard results table. Now there are lots of variations that you might get in the standard results table, people using different letters and writing them in different ways and including different types of functions. I've got a basic table here with some of the basic and most common functions. If you want to know how to use these rules to do differentiation, my next two videos are what you need. The next video contains examples of how to differentiate functions that have x's with powers, including roots and when the x is in the denominator. The next video after that contains examples of sine, cos, ln and e. So if you want to have a look at the examples, click on the next videos. So hopefully that has given you a good understanding of what differentiation actually is and it will make your life easier when doing differentiation in the future.